Good morning, Rockway Assembly. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. It's great to join together, even though we cannot be in a physical location together. We can be together by the power of the Holy Spirit as we unite our hearts and our thoughts together to worship our Lord today. We want to express some appreciation to some very special people who are making a real difference in Rockaway Assembly of God during this very difficult time. And that is Jen Volgazang and her team in our children's ministries. They are working hard to minister to the children of our church in very different ways. Every Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock, Jen goes online and so does some of her team. They go through Zoom and they are ministering to the children of our church. In the middle of the week, uh, Jen or somebody does a Bible story and so we're seeking to to minister to the children of our church, and we appreciate their efforts, the efforts of the Impact and the Ranger team as they continue to minister in their areas. But most of all, we want to just say thank you, Jen, for spearheading our effort for our children of Rockaway Assembly of God. Also, we want to express our appreciation to you, our church family, who've been giving faithfully over the last several weeks uh, through your tithes and your offerings. We appreciate your faithfulness. We still have expenses here at the church, though we're not physically together. We still have a mortgage to pay, just like you do. We still have utilities. We're still taking care of our staff. So we can only can do that if you continue to be faithful in your giving. And you can give through our website, through the Easy Tithe app, uh, website there on the screen for you, or by mailing your check to Post Office Box 242, Rockaway, New Jersey, 07866. Thank you for your faithfulness. We also believe in the power of prayer, and many of you have been sharing your prayer requests. Some of them have to do with family and friends who are experiencing extreme difficulty during this uh, COVID-19 crisis. Some of them have been exposed to this virus. Others are uh, experiencing financial difficulties, and we're praying for each of you. The staff prays over our prayer request. We send them out to an intercessor's team, and they're praying for you. And you can send those prayer requests to Marianne at rockawayag.org, or you can call the church office. The phone number is there on your screen, and we'll be glad to pray with you and to believe God with you to see God answer our prayers as we seek his face. And let's do that right now as we seek his presence in today's service. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this opportunity to take a pause in kind of strange times and difficult circumstances just to center our hearts and our minds on you. You are a faithful and awesome God, and we thank you for this privilege of coming together into your presence. Lord, as we worship you this morning in song, as we receive your word from our pastor, Lord God, we pray your anointing upon each and everything that takes place, that your name would be glorified, that we might receive what we need to not only to serve you and to love you, but to serve the world around us, that we might share with them the good news of your love and your grace. Lord, let your anointing flow, and we praise you and we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's worship the Lord together, church.
mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Lord, I thank you so much, God, that we could still worship you together, God, whether it's inside these four walls or out. Lord, your Holy Spirit is with us the same way wherever we go, God. I just thank you for this worship team and just ask your richest blessings on them, God, as they continue to serve your church here in Rockaway. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. It is so good to be with you again. 
Um, I miss you guys. We're looking forward to doing some more Zoom chats. My wife and I have been involved in tons of small groups. We have some more small groups we're going to be in this Saturday, uh, some more meetings that are taking place. We want to connect. We want to get to know you. We want to say hi, see what's going on in your life, and if there's any needs in the church that we should know about. Well, I'm so excited to share this new series with you. It'll officially be the first series that we ever get to share together here at Rockaway Assembly of God. And the title of the series is called Meet the Pastor. And I'm just going to share a couple of, of portions of scripture that really help make me the person that I am in God. Some, some scripture that has shaped me and molded me. And the title of this message specifically is called It Is Well. It Is Well. And we're going to be talking about peace. And I have a, a, a short video to show you that I think illustrates peace so perfectly, I have to warn you, don't be holding a drink and make sure that your, your kids uh, are ready for this fantastic video. So, All right, well, I hope that no one spilled any drinks or got too scared, but I think this video so perfectly illustrates peace, and, and peace is something that we know that God wants us to have, and so few of us have the peace that I think God wants us to, to live in, to experience daily, and, and Pastor Jim shared a great Devo this Wednesday. I would encourage you to check it out if you haven't seen it, but it has a lot to do with with what's inside of you. So when, if you want to figure out the amount of peace that you have in your life, all you need to do is go through a little trial and see what comes out of that. If you respond in peace with trusting God, with keeping your focus fixed on him, or if we get panicky, if we fall apart and whatnot. I remember when I was young, I was in college and, uh, my, a good friend of mine would always ask me, he would say, do you have peace in your heart? And my first response would be like, yeah, I have peace in my heart. And then I'd be like, man, why, why does he ask me that? Why did I have to ask if I have peace in my heart? And, and sometimes I, I was like, you know, I don't even know what peace is. How, do, how am I supposed to have peace in my heart? And it was in college in particular that God revealed the, just these, these scripture to me and taught me about peace in a very real way, in a very different way. So let me define peace for you. In the dictionary, peace is a state of tranquility. In the Old Testament, we see peace associated with many different things. We see the theme of peace and prosperity or peace and security. We see peace associated with the moral compass that someone might have in terms of their faithfulness or their, their righteousness. And, and we see the, the prophecy, the promise of one day God giving us a prince of peace. In the New Testament, now Jesus totally revolutionizes what peace is. And, and he brings peace to a whole nother level. And, and we see that we have a peace that never leaves us. And, and no matter what we go through, we will always have. And most of Paul's letters are, are started off with a greeting of peace and of blessing. So we see this theme of peace over and over. But I want to give you my definition of peace this morning. Peace is when everything in your life is going wrong or it feels like things are falling apart that you can still focus on how right things are. So when everything around you is going wrong and you are able to focus on how right God ultimately is. That is my definition of peace for you. And it's the peace that I want you to have this morning. There are two principles of peace in this passage in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. And, and peace is something that God wants you to have to the fullest. We see even at the point of death of so many of the, the earliest church fathers and, and Jesus' disciples, they had peace. And even when Stephen was martyred, we see him praying for forgiveness for the people that were killing him. This is what peace looks like, church. This is the peace that God wants you to have. So let's look at these two principles of peace in Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. And it says this, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. 
Think about these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all that you learned and received from me, everything that you heard from me and saw me doing, and then the God of peace will be with you. Church, I want the God of peace to be with you, and I want you to know that the God of peace is with you wherever you go and whatever you do. The first principle of peace here is to focus our thoughts. Focus our thoughts. The diet of our brain determines the peace that's in our heart, and I want you to understand that this morning. There's a principle here of if you put garbage into your life, then garbage is going to come out of your life. I remember when I was younger, I ran cross country in high school, and I loved cross country. It was so much fun. Uh, it, was a, it was just as much of a mental challenge as it was a physical challenge, and <clears throat> This high school crush of mine was at one of my meets, and I was like, I was like, I have to do good. And, and one of the, the things that you do in cross country, the, the long, long running, is, is that you pace yourself. And the guys that are really incredible, they could like sprint and get out in front and then like pace themselves really well. And, and I would prefer to just pace myself at the start and then try and finish as strong as I could when others were fading. And this one time, so I, this girl was there watching, and there was like a sprint to get to the woods where, where everybody was watching. And I was like, I'm going to be the first one there. And I, and I, was, I was okay at cross country. Um, I was a better sprinter than I was a cross country runner. Uh, but so anyway, I, I sprinted to the woods, and I was the first one in the woods. And and it's cool because, like, everybody saw me. They're like, oh, who's that kid? And, and, you know, I got to the woods before some of the more well-known people who were really good at this, at this meet we had. The only problem was it hurt really bad being the first one there. And, and I had one of my worst times in my whole high school career because I had, I had sprinted at the start of that. However, it wasn't just the sprint. It wasn't the, the, the sprint that killed me. I probably could have done the sprint. The thing that made it really bad was that I went to, to Burger King before the meet. I was starving. I was so hungry, and uh, I was like, you know what? I, gotta, I just got to eat something. And so I just had a little snack at Burger King, you know, a little something. I got a, I got a Whopper combo meal, and I got a rodeo cheeseburger, and a chicken crisp sandwich, and onion rings. And it already had fries and a, and a drink with it. So instead of having soda, I had iced tea. As a high schooler, you know, I thought I was indestructible and I could do whatever I wanted. And so I put all of this garbage into me, coupled with the silly sprint that I shouldn't have done at the start. And it was literally the worst meat I ever had in my life. And then I think I finished the race and I keeled over and I just threw up all over the place. I mean, it was like Burger King again. So anyway, you know, it's, it's the same principle that God is trying to convey to us here in Philippians chapter 4 verses 8 and 9. The same way we put junk into ourselves physically, and I don't know about you, but I'm trying to avi avoid the, the quarantine 15, but you put junk in your body physically, then you don't exercise as much as you normally do, and you are going to get the quarantine 15. It is the same thing in here, the, the junk that we put into our, our minds that on a daily basis, that is the, the, the stuff that determines what is going to come out of us. So God wants us to focus our thoughts. You've heard it said, you, you reap what you sow. And it's the same principle here spiritually. How frequently in our lives as Christians do we spend countless hours on our phones, in front of TVs, just doing stuff that doesn't really edify us at all? And then it's going to determine our actions later. But we need to focus on these things here that Paul says are excellent or are, and are worthy of praise. Things that are excellent are worthy of praise. So let's look at what these things are. The first thing here, it says to focus and fix, fix our focus on things that are true. So what are things that are true? True means valid, reliable, and honest. It's the opposite of false. The Bible, Jesus is the truth. And in the New Testament, we see that Jesus is the truth. Truth characterizes God, and it should characterize our lives 
as believers. Truth is something that stays with you wherever you go. Truth is, is who you are when you are at work. It's, truth is who you are when no one else is around. And, and, and truth will, will tell you that you can't be two different people, three different people, that you can't act a, a different way, that if you are walking and living in truth, your character is consistent. In John 17, 17, we see the, the word of God. There's a prayer that, that we would be sanctified by truth. Do you understand that Jesus is the truth this morning and that you are to walk with that truth? We live in a day and age where truth is, is, uh, is all relative. You might have your truth. I might have my truth. Someone else might have their truth. And whatever someone believes determines their truth. But that's not what the word of God says about truth. We need to be lovers of the truth as Christians. We need to be lovers of the truth. And, and I want you to know that, church. I want you to walk in that, tru in, in that truth. And, and our world desperately needs the truth. Not a truth, not our truth or their truth, the truth. And that is the first thing that God calls us, that Paul is telling us here, to focus our thoughts on. So what is honorable? The Bible uses the word honorable to refer usually to a person's character. It is a quality that makes one worthy of praise and respect. And when I think of someone who's honorable, uh, man, I have so many great people in my life, but my mom was so honorable. She was selfless. When we were younger, she worked full-time, cooked all of our meals. She played with us. Uh, you know, we would, she would take us to the park. She watched me play video games when I was younger, then came to my sporting events when I was older. Then she served as our church Sunday school teacher. She was the president of our school FSA. Then she became the president of our board, town board of education. Um, but, but man, it wasn't just all the, the works that she did. It was the character that she did it with that made her honorable. She was one of the most loving and selfless people I have ever met in my life. God blessed me with two amazing parents, and, and uh, man, I, I, I'm just super blessed. But, but that's one of the things that, that, is, that is honorable. Do you have anyone in your life that you think is worthy of honor? Because I'm willing to bet that you have a couple people that, that, that you would say they, they have done things that are morally right, and, and they are worthy of honor. The next thing it says here is what is right. Right is associated with righteousness and what's conformable to God's ways. Right is associated with the absence of wrongdoing. In the day and age we live in, there is no right or wrong anymore. There, there's just, you know, do whatever you want or do what feels good, and, and there's this, this focus and obsession with feeling. But God calls us as believers to focus our thoughts on what is right, on what is right. And, and I can tell you so many of the TV shows today, it's like the, the people have no moral compass. The, the reality TV that, that and now I don't watch reality TV, but every once in a while I'll catch an episode of something and I'll just be like, these people must be insane. All right, They're, if this is what, what is right to them or if this is what reality is like, I feel like my view of reality is very different from their view of reality. Uh, but, but man, it, it's, it's not right. People act in a way that, that it's not just displeasing to God. It's like they hurt themselves. Friends, when we fix our thoughts on things that are right, then, then we avoid doing wrong. We avoid wandering into to things that are wrong. So the next thing that it says here, that uh, then our next focus should be on things that are pure. Things that are pure. Pure doesn't just mean to be free from sin, although that's a good thing and uh, that's an important thing. But pure is something frequently uh, associated with, with our desire as Christians to remain unstained and unblemished from the world. We should strive for moral purity. And one of the things that I think of when, when I think of pure is babies. And I remember my dad telling me when, when I was born, he remembered looking at me and, and just saying, you know, my, my son is pure. Not just that he hasn't sinned, but my son doesn't know any discrimination. My son doesn't know any racism. My son doesn't know any, any hatred or anything like that. I was totally pure. And, and it is what God calls us to be as Christians, and he, it's, it's part of the focus that we should have if we ever want to experience peace the way that God intends. The next thing the Bible says here is lovely. Now, when I think of lovely, 
I think of my wife, all right? I, I call her my lovely bride, and I tell her that, that she is lovely, and, um, you know, if she ever does something, I'm like, and, and, and I, I tell her, I'm like, and some of, you, some of you have probably heard me say this to her, I'm like, oh, that's lovely, or you did that so lovely. But, but um, you know, in the Bible, lovely is, is a, it's, it's talking about something that's pleasing or agreeable, something that brings joy to your heart. And are the things that we are focused on, are they bringing joy to our heart? Or are they things that are mindlessly entertaining us? I know, I know my son recently, in, during this quarantine, he loves to, to play video games. And we've let him play a little more than normal. And when we, we tell him, that's it, you've had your hours for the day, he's like, ugh. And I'm, and I'm trying to tell him, I'm like, you know, Elijah, it's just, it's just occupying your time with mindless entertainment. There's, there's nothing in there that, that is lovely at all. It's nothing that, that is really pleasing to you long term. So we don't, we don't want to settle for things that are short term. We want to do things like that are going to make us better, that are going to bring us closer to God. We want to keep our sacred routines and disciplines. Um, and, and man, that's, that's what, it, what it is to, to focus on something that is lovely. The next thing that it says here, the last thing that it says here is admirable. Now, this word for admirable in the New Testament only occurs here, and it denotes what is praiseworthy, attractive, and what rings true to the highest standards. It's the last thing that, that we are called to focus on here. And now, when you think of a person that you admire, and now there's a difference here between honorable, because honorable focuses more on the character, and admirable focuses a little more on the accomplishment— um, you think of someone who has done something great, something who has done, you know, something large, something that has come with great sacrifice, great price. Um, man, I, I remember when I was young, I, younger, I loved watching Charles Barkley play basketball. And now he was the round mound of rebound. And I don't know if any of you guys know much about basketball or know who Charles Barkley is. He's, he can be a little obnoxious and he was a little obnoxious back then, but he played a lot bigger than he was, and and I I remember seeing him play the uh, the su the Bulls in the finals one year, and I was so hoping that Barkley was going to be the first one to beat Jordan in the finals, and that didn't happen, and my dreams were crushed. But but no, you know he he was just someone in my eyes that was admirable, and now now you might not think that's that admirable, and it probably isn't that admirable. Uh, but but man, I've had so many spiritual fathers that that on another level are truly worthy of, of being admired. I have uh, my, my senior pastor from when I was very young. Uh, still, I still keep in touch with him. I actually just got a phone call from him um, a day ago, and I, and I am going to give him a call back. But, but man, this is someone who, who has done great things for God. And, and because of how much I admire him, it makes me want to serve God on a whole nother level. And these are the things that, that, that Paul tells us here, that our thoughts should be fixed on. So church, I ask you this morning, where have your thoughts been fixed? Are your thoughts fixed on maybe the stock market? Maybe you lost some money in stock? Are your, are your thoughts fixed on, on your marriage? I hope that it's going well. Are your thoughts fixed on uh, the, this big scary virus? Or are your thoughts fixed on, on, on so many other things? Or, or are they fixed on God? Because when your thoughts are fixed on the things that Paul says here, the things that are excellent or praiseworthy, then it doesn't matter what you go through. It doesn't matter if you have speed bumps in your life. It doesn't matter, you know, and, and I know a bunch of people are furloughed right now, and, and there's a bunch of struggles. And, and, and that's not saying p having peace, focusing on things that are excellent or praiseworthy that bring peace to your life, it's not saying that you will have the absence of, of, of storms or the absence of issues. It's saying that you're choosing to focus on things that are excellent or praiseworthy, regardless of what is going on in your life. And I pray that for you this morning, church, that whatever you were going through, that you will be able to fix your thoughts on things that are excellent and praiseworthy. They're things that, are ins that inspire us to be more Christ-like. Paul understood that right thinking brings peace. That thinking, according to the way God desires, will bring, bring peace to our life in a way that we would never have. And now, there's a bunch of different things called that I, I'd like to label peace busters this morning. There's a new Ghostbusters coming out, and 
and I saw the trailer, and I remember Ghostbusters from when I was a kid, and I was like, oh, it looks sort of cool. And, and thinking about Ghostbusters, uh, you know, they go around and they bust ghosts with these little laser zapper, these, I forget what they're called. It's been a long time since I saw it. But the Peace Busters will do the same thing in our life. The, the, these are things that will bust up peace in our life, and, and that's sin, it's fear, it's anxiety, it's worry, it's anger, it's lust, it's depression, it's peer pressure. These are things that will bust up the peace in our life. And Paul was familiar with the garbage in, garbage out philosophy, this notion. And, and we need to be very careful of the same things in our life, or we will be zapped of the ability to have peace in our life. I have, I've had bunch of, a bunch of people ask me uh, over the course of the last uh, 15, 20 years or so since I, was, uh, since I was in college, they asked me, how, how do I remain so calm in, in so many different situations? And it's because I, I have understood that I can have peace if I fix, if I focus my thoughts on things that are excellent or praiseworthy. Let's do that together as a church this morning. And the second thing I see here is that our actions will focus. When we can focus our thoughts on things that are excellent or praiseworthy, then our actions will follow. This, mean, this means that peace starts with what we think, and then it goes to our heart. It ends in our heart and the actions that come out of them. As the, I love the analogy, again, Pastor Jim had on Wednesday, where you know, he poured the water in and then all the things popped out. It's, it's true of peace. That is, that is, when we focus our thoughts on things that are excellent or praiseworthy, our actions will then focus. I am no expert when it comes to taking pictures. I love to take pictures, and I notice on my iPhone that there's like an autofocus, and that you, you get your phone, right? And you find the target of what you want to take a picture of, and then it autofocuses around the target to give you a clear, clear picture. It's the same with peace. It's the same with when, when we spiritually find the target of things excellent or praiseworthy, our whole life will autofocus around that, and then peace will come out. Then peace will come out. It is what God calls us to do to be able to have peace in the way that he wants us to have peace. And church, I want you to experience peace in your life in a way that you never have. And in order for us to do that, we need to be able to auto-focus on things excellent or praiseworthy, true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. And then our actions will follow. It's what God wants us to do. When, when our, it's for our actions to focus. It starts with how we think. I've talked to so many people in my life that have come to me and they've said, Pastor Ken, I, I have no idea why I acted that way. I, I, someone, people who have gotten divorced or had just um, some marriage issues or someone that blew up on someone one day, have, have maybe, and now I know that no one here would ever do that, but maybe you blew up on someone sometime and, and you know, you're, you look back on it and you were like, man, I don't know why I blew up on them. It, it, that, it just, it really wasn't that bad in hindsight. Something was small. It wasn't that big of a deal and I blew up. It's because our thoughts weren't focused, and then our actions followed it. No one ever gets married, right? Now, I want you to think, for those of you that are married or those of you that want to be married someday, you, you think about your wedding day, and you dream about all the things that are going to happen, and, and you're like, man, I can't wait to get married and, you know, find my, my prince or princess charming and—, and and, you know, you're, there's just such excitement and anticipation. And I don't know anything that's entered with such high hopes and, and excitement as marriage that ends so terribly or the, where the commitment fades. And, and it's because the actions follow our thoughts. No one ever dreamed of their, their marriage thinking, you know, I I'm, can't wait to get married today. It's my wedding day. And, and you know, someday I'm, I'm dreaming of the, this great, terrible, nasty divorce where we both hate each other and it ruins our kids. And, and that's what I'm, you know, no one, get, no one gets married, right? No one gets married thinking about that. It's entered the, the thoughts and the focus is all on the, the amazing potential, the covenant that God has ordained marriage to be. But somewhere along the line, what happens is, is people think, the grass is greener elsewhere, poor me, 
And, and, and it's slowly but surely we're not focused on things that are excellent or praiseworthy. If you're watching with your spouse today, I just want you to turn to them and tell them you are lovely, all right? Turn to your spouse and say, you are lovely. Marjorie, you know this because I tell you all the time, but you are lovely. And, and I don't think we do it justice by, by sharing those things with our spouse and even by telling ourselves those things, by remembering the, and, and same thing with, you know, it, could, it applies to marriage, but it applies to your job. So many people right now wish they were still in, in, in work, wish they didn't get laid off, wish they didn't get furloughed. And man, if you still have a job, as much as you might hate going to work or not like things about it, thank God for it today. Because what, what happens, and I've seen this plenty of times, is, is people start to sour on a blessing that God has given them because their, their thoughts had led them away from that. So thoughts in the head are not enough. It needs to, to transfer to our heart as well. And, and let me tell you one of the deeper truths of Christianity right now. Your head should control your heart and not vice versa. That's one of the principles in this passage. And, and sometimes Christians, and, and I've seen it, you know, a Christian that justifies being in a same-sex relationship because that, that's how they felt, or, or one that, that, ones that have gotten divorced because they, they don't love the person that they committed to marrying anymore, or people that have quit jobs because, you know, they felt like their boss was treating them unfairly. And I get it. Now, sometimes there are grounds for these things, but more often than not, it's just, it's we believe lies. It's that we believe the feelings instead of the truth. It's that our, our focus was on the, you know, the actions, and, and we didn't have focus on right thinking. We didn't have focus on, on things that were excellent or praiseworthy. So that's how this happens. That's how, you know, people fall off a cliff, you know, spiritually, is it's, it's their thoughts little by little. And I have a handful of, of friends that I've known at different times that have totally fallen away from the faith. I was conversing with one of them on, on Facebook this, this week, just saying, you know, are, are your views consistent and how do you justify the morality and the compassion that you still have? And they're like, and they have no answer because there's really no reason for that in a, in a, in a world without God. But, but what happens is they believe lies slowly but surely. It's they stop focusing on things that are excellent or praiseworthy, things that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable, and they start to focus on things that, that they shouldn't, and it's, and it's how they slowly get moved away bit by bit. And this is what Paul is saying in verse 9, the, the things that you've heard or seen in me uh, or received from me or the, the, the things that you learned or saw me do, these are the things that you're supposed to put into practice. But we can never follow that, that order. We can never follow that order of putting into practice if that's not where our thoughts are. Where your thoughts go, your actions will follow you, church. Where your thoughts go, your actions will follow you. So what does the diet of your mind consist of? Is it helping others or is it laziness? Is it doing for others or doing for yourself? Is it the comfort of others or the comfort of self? And I could go on and on, but, but I hope that everyone in your life, when they see your life, they see someone that is fixed and focused on things that are excellent or praiseworthy. I, I heard it put like this a, a long time ago. If you sow a thought, you reap an action. If you sow an action, you reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you reap your character. And if you sow your character, you reap your destiny. So it starts with thoughts and goes to actions and then habit, character, destiny. So your thoughts will determine your destiny, church. Your thoughts will determine the peace that you have in your life. And this word for practice here, it's proso, and it, and it means something <clears throat> to be done in continuous action. It's something to do over and over and over and over and over. It's something that God wants you to keep doing. The, the English word doesn't really do it justice. It's something that, that is, is to be put into practice daily and regularly and as often as possible. So that means even when you're really angry, right? That's one of the peace busters. Even when you're really angry with someone about something, focus on things that are excellent or praiseworthy. The things that are true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and admirable. Maybe even about that person, about the situation, but focus on things 
that are excellent are praiseworthy. And I don't know about how many of you have seen Lord of the Rings, but I absolutely love Lord of the Rings. And, and uh, there's Frodo who carries this ring, which represents sin. The whole thing is like a great spiritual analogy about how Christianity works. And the ring represents the burden of sin. <clears throat> And one person carries it, and Sam, his, his best friend, is always so upbeat and so positive. And Sam is someone who doesn't have a peace buster in his life, right? He's not bearing the, the weight of sin on his life, trying to get rid of it. But, but Sam is, like, is, like Frodo is, Sam is encouraging him, telling him to focus on things that are excellent or praiseworthy, like his hometown and the people in it and, you know, someone's smile and all of those things. Sam knew that he should focus on things excellent or praiseworthy. Because he wasn't going to change Frodo's actions just by saying, well, well, you shouldn't do that. And, and I think far too often we do that. We focus on the action that we want to change rather than the symptom. And the symptom is er, er, rather than the, the root of the symptom. And the root of it comes from what we think. If we're just trying to modify our behavior, it's never going to work. It's going to be through submission to the Holy Spirit and, and he, the help to focus on things that are excellent and praiseworthy. And that's what God wants us to do. Those are the two principles of, of peace that are in these passage, the, this passage here. And, and, and I just want to share my, my favorite story. It's one of my all-time favorites, and um, I shared it with a few of you recently. But, but it's the story of, of H.G. Spafford, and, and um, <clears throat> It's the, the title of the message for the, this series is It Is Well. And, and where the song comes from, It Is Well, that so many of you know, it, it comes from him losing his four children in a, in a boating accident. It was in 1873, the French liner, the SS Ville du Havre, was the most luxurious, luxurious ship afloat when it sailed from New York in November 1873. And among the passengers was, was Miss Spafford of Chicago making the trip with their children, Maggie, Tanetta, Annie, and Bessie. And Mr. Spafford had business to attend to before he could go. And he said goodbye, promising to meet them in France in a few weeks. And at two o'clock on the morning of November 22nd, 1873, when the luxury liner was several days out, it was rammed by an English iron sailing vessel, the Lockhearn. In two hours, the Ville de Havre, one of the largest luxury ships afloat, settled to the bottom of the ocean with a loss of some 226 lives, including the four children of the Spafford family. Nine days later, when the survivors landed in Cardiff, Wales, Miss Spafford cabled her husband with two words that said, Saved alone. When he received her message, he said, to a dear friend, I am glad to trust the Lord when it will cost me something. I am glad to trust the Lord when it will cost me something. Friends, this is not earthly possible. This is not something that someone without God can say. There would have been, and, and I'm sure he mourned intensely, but people fall apart. I've seen so many people fall apart for less May we never do that as Christians. May our focus always be, may our thoughts be focused on the things that are excellent or praiseworthy. So then our actions are focused because of that. So he went over to meet his family and the, the captain said, I, we're passing over the place where your boat went down and your children are at the bottom of the ocean. And it was that night at that spot that Horatio G. Spafford penned the words, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Church, what an encouragement. What a, what a, what's, what a thing to admire, to honor. This is someone that, that was focused on things that we should be focused on. And his actions were focused because of that. I couldn't imagine being in that type of predicament and saying, you know, this is a great time to write a hymn that will become famous one day to God after I just lost people that I love dearly. This is what peace looks like. These are the, the principles of peace and work. And there is a power in peace that is not to be had or found any other way. It is the peace that God calls us to today. That is the peace that God wants us to walk in as a church. So where is your focus this morning, church? 
Where is your focus? Are you focused on things that are excellent or, and praiseworthy? Or are you focused on things that are a million miles away from that? Friends, I, I don't want you to, to turn off your computer or your TV this morning without focusing your thoughts on things that are excellent or praiseworthy. If you're at home, will you stand with me as I could, I just want to pray with you this morning, and I, and I hope that you, you feel the Holy Spirit with you. I hope that you know that God is with you uh, as, as we're standing here today. But if you have things in your life that have busted up, that have robbed you of peace in your life, lay those things down this morning and let us pray together. Lord, I thank you so much for my church family, God. Lord, I ask God that this morning, first, if there is any peace busters in our lives, God, that we would lay them at your feet this morning. And God, I just pray that every member, God, every person watching today, Lord, that, that we would experience peace the way that you have called us to experience peace. God, that our, that our thoughts would be focused on things that are excellent or praiseworthy. And God, that, that we would be able to see our actions follow. Lord, may we have a healthy diet mentally and spiritually, especially in the season that we are in, that our focus would constantly be on you. And God, that we would see the incredible power of peace at work as the actions follow our thoughts, God. Lord, may we be a people, God, that, that are always led, that our, heart, or our head always controls our heart, and our heart wouldn't lead us away from you. And God, that our actions glorify you so much. Lord, I ask blessings again on everyone that is with us today, especially those in need of peace. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, church. I hope you have a super blessed rest of the day, and I look forward to connecting soon. God bless you.